Hello to everybody, this is uh, Harry Box with Technical Trader, and today I'm going to talk about analyzing um, early price and volume action and early trend development to be able to pick the winners in terms of day trading. Now the same kind of patterns that we're going to talk about today also apply for swing trading and intermediate trading, and I'll show you examples of that a little later on. But uh, let, let's just say that it's important to develop a disciplined and focused approach. And of the more than 45 years I've been trading, especially since I started the Deck Trader, 12 years ago. I've noticed that my trading skills and more successful trading record have been greatly enhanced since I created a more focused approach. And it was uh, this was mainly due to my subscribers and, my, and relying on my service for accurate technical advice. So I decided to uh, create a very focused plan each night because they say uh, plan your trade and trade your plan, right? Um, and one of the things that most people don't do is spend some time in the evening after the market closes and go over a lot of the patterns that are, um, that developed during the prior session as to whether or not they could be possibly set up for the next day. Consolidation patterns that didn't break out that may be a setup for a gap up the next day or a follow through session. I love when stocks are run trending in channels over a five or 15 minute chart and create one minute day trade patterns. In the very early action of searching for important gaps of at least four or five percent and preferably much more. Early analysis of opening price gaps with volume, something I've coined the price volume surge, and how that relates to the previous trend as to overhead resistance and recent technical trends is a must. The opening gap price will often act as support for the session, and whether that holds or not early on in the session is most often a key in determining if a stock will then start up a tradable intraday uptrend or channel for the rest of the session and be a high probability scalp or day trade for at least that day. Usually if the opening gap price is quickly broken as in a pop and drop scenario, so for example, a lot of these biotech stocks will pop and then drop and immediately break support, um, you'll, you'll see that that occurs in some of the examples that I'll show you a little bit later. But, and because I'm going to be very, very fair with you, I'm not just showing you my winners, I'll show you some of the stocks that didn't work out today as well. And a lot of the examples I'm going to show you, such as the chart on the screen, Arena, is the stock we actually traded today. So um, if a stock does gap significantly and then holds that level, usually the development of an early uptrend will become evident in the first 20 or 30 minutes of trading, sometimes longer. In the case of Arena, it took a couple hours for it to set up a coil here, and then it trended. Many successful traders I've known or observed over the years will not anticipate, rather they'll wait for the trend to begin to develop or the early patterns, be they flags, wedges, falling wedges, any type of consolidation continuation pattern. They'll wait for those patterns to break out. For example, in the case of Arena here, you'll see it pop, pull back, got narrower and narrower and narrower, quieter, low volume ebb right here. And that's where it started to pop with a little bit of increase in volume. That's where the trade began, about the $8 level. Um, and reached uh, 8.51 a couple hours later. That was a nice 6-7% um, trade. Um, so some people will anticipate, others may choose to wait for that first pullback or early consolidation that I refer to as, um, uh, as the boxer wedge or a coil pennant flag. And that's the first consolidation pattern, no matter what you call it or what it looks like. In this case, a coil. But I always look for the gap up, the pullback, and then for some kind of development of a coil. And usually, I'm very excited about a stock when I see it holding the 50-period moving average. This is a two-minute chart, but even on a one-minute chart, as you can see here, the way it developed was similar, and it held near that 50-period moving average. I do look at one-minute charts during the day, and sometimes I'll pull back and look at a five-minute chart to see what the prior day looked like. And you can see that there was overhead resistance up here, at 849, therefore my target on this one, even before it got up here, when it first broke out, was projected to be 845, 848, and it reached, I think the high for the day was, let's see, 851. So we were within a few pennies of getting the high for the day, but it closed very well, uh, and you can see after hours it was firm as well. But let's get back to what I was referring to. One Harry, of my favorite... Can I interrupt you for a moment? Yeah, sure. Can I interrupt you for a moment? We have a question, and I know you've asked that we... Um, what you wanted to mention to people to, uh, that you will leave some time at the end of your talk for questions? Right. Okay. Um, it is pertaining to what you're talking about now as to what you consider significant gapping. 
in terms of a percentage? And again, you can hold off till later, but I thought I would... No, I might as well answer that now. I think I already said that. I'm looking for at least a gap of 4 or 5%, preferably 10, 20, or 30%. I want a stock that's gapping. And then I'm going to analyze the news to see why it's gapping. Um, some stocks are gapping for no reason or for very little legitimate reasons, and this other stock may be gapping because of a blowout in earnings or four, four, four or five firms may have up, up the recommendation to a buy or something like that. That happened in a couple stocks today. Um, but I'm also looking for volume because price without volume to me is just not tradable. Um, one of the things I try to avoid, I keep getting ideas from my subscribers all day. One of the beauties of my trading room is that I have some very brilliant traders in there that see stocks that I don't. I have two eyes, two eyes to watch 12,000 stocks. That's quite a few. But when I have a couple hundred people or 150 people, whatever the number may be in my room, and they're all watching the market, they often come up with great ideas, which benefits the room. So that's the beauty of my trading. Um, it's that first consolidation pattern that's key for me. Um, my favorite pattern is a what we call a wedge or a coil. This is a, a coil. The reason why it's not a wedge is a wedge is more symmetrical, and a coil is narrower and elongated. That's the way I define a coil on a wedge. But really interesting, it's something I want to show you here, folks, that if you use TCNet, and it's a terrific program, I've been using it for 20 years, and I'm one of the uh, preferred speakers for Warden Brothers in the training seminars, uh, is that a column here called volume buzz. Nobody has it. Nobody. Volume buzz is simply at any one point in time, whether it be five minutes after the opening, an hour after the opening, or three hours after the opening, It'll tell you what the percentage of volume over the average for that period of time, that point of time in the day, it'll tell you what percentage of volume is trading above normal, above, or I think it's over the last 90 days. In any case, you can see in the case of these top seven or eight stocks, they had high percentage volume days on down days. Kind of interesting, huh? But also there was quite a few that had big days. Now, early in the session, this may be two, three, five thousand, ten thousand. I've seen 30 thousand percent above normal when it's a biotech stock that got approval that was a thinly traded stock that may, may be trading eight or ten million when it was trading forty or fifty thousand a day. So you'll see big percentage gains. And the reason why I, I look for the volume buzz is to see where money may be flowing early on in the session. If I see the pattern I like, if I see the volume I like, and I see this as being a big percentage of volume over normal, plus the percent gain may be you know five, ten or fifteen percent early on in the day. That may very well extend, and that's where I get a lot of my trading ideas. Um, TCNet is, by the way, it's a free program. The chart, it's the, the software itself is free. It's like, oh, it's like 70 or 80 bucks a month for the, for the data to update the system every day. But it's real time. They've just incorporated pre- and post-hour trading. You can see 4 p.m. here. This is where it traded after hours. So it gives you a really... Uh, Really, and by the way, I love the black background with the colors. It's, it stands out for you with the colored bars here. Some of the up days and down days and unbalanced volume line. The, 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 these, these indicators down here, money stream balance and power, are proprietary to Warden Brothers. I highly recommend the program. I've been using it a long time. After I've done my early analysis using various tools that we just talked about, along with my many years of technical analysis and pattern recognition abilities, one of the things I pride myself on is recognizing patterns. I see them even before I draw the lines. But one of the things that several people at Warden Brothers have told me that they learned from me in, my, in doing my seminars is to draw these lines in. For example, this line here, this line goes back, if you look at the daily chart, all the way back several months. And not these declining tops here. That also came in about 845. So that's why that was a target for me today, because I knew there was overhead resistance up there. So what we did here is um, then drill down to the one-minute chart, and we, you can see the patterns as they develop intraday. Uh, but we also have this line that was set from weeks ago that turns out to be not only a resistance level, but look how it thwarted the advance and knocked it right back. I find that very interesting. After I've done my analysis, and I, found, I, I will create a focus list. It's very important in the morning when I'm looking at 20 or 30 stocks to focus it down at 8, 10, or 12. I want to have a certain amount of stocks I'm following that's not too inundated for my people. 
Um, it's also inundated for anybody to follow too many stocks at one time. Now, on, on, in the course of the session, when patterns don't develop, I'll drop them off the focus list. But in ex for example, here you'll see that I, I simply flag all these blue flags are stock on my focus list for today's talk, and I'll show you some patterns after I'm done with my little talk. But these are stocks that are either uh, day trades or swing trades that I've initiated in the last day, day or several days, and we'll go over them a little later on. The mo most difficult task and critical task for traders is to create the focus list because um, I find that uh, to, uh, by doing that, you avoid the pitfalls of many traders in the early session by eliminating from consideration certain lower price stocks like under 2 or $3 that may be too thin float-wise, not have enough uh, volume percentage above normal. Um, and, you must, and then you're going to be looking at the chart for analyzing overhead resistance. Um, and uh, we're going to look at the trend lines and moving averages and where that all affects the, the, the price. And this way you can come up with more uh, focused approach and a more uh, um, defined approach for what you want to do with the stock once you bought it. Because the one thing me, most traders don't do that I highly recommend and what I do in my trading room, when I recommend a stock, I give you support, resistance, and targets and stops. I'm not going to hold your hand and tell you what exact point to buy it. I'm not going to say buy it at this price. I'm going to say here's your support, here's your resistance, it's a buy alert now, here's my targets, here's my stop. This way you can make some decisions if you want to even get involved. It's usually best to pick more tradable liquid stocks than uh, that are experiencing big price volume surges and breaking out because of better market sponsorship and the ability to move in and out quickly and have bids and asks. You don't want to be trading a thin stock that may be difficult to, to sell. Institutions or institutional High volume traders most often will shy away from stocks under five, and many will even avoid issues under ten. Also, depending on the news sources, traders need to determine if any news is possibly a key in the trend determining factor or a game changer. For example, in the case of a biotech stock, take a look at KERX, for example. Would you have to say that, that would you say that this move here was a game changer? Definitely the breakaway gap here with big uh, drug approval news was a game changer. For the next four or five days, the stock rocketed from three to ten. And that's the kind of move we want to be involved with, momentum move. By the way, this is also uh, a current idea of mine. I think the stock is going to work its well high, itself higher. We've seen a lot of stocks do that. SRPT was a beauty for us. Here it popped. And we got, got involved with this consolidation. When it broke out above here, that was our, our, our play. We had a swing trade there. We pulled back. It broke out again. And we actually got lucky because we bought it the day before. And it gapped up and went up from uh, 13 or 14 to 45 in one day. Now, it's not usual, but it did happen for us. So my, that, my point about trading liquid stocks, for the most part, during this course of the session, <clears throat> you want to trade a stock that's got at least Four or five hundred thousand shares, and many times five or ten times that. You know, several, a couple million would be nice. Um, once you're armed with the proper technical tools and have done your homework, you can trade your plan and make some money. So, um, quickly, are there any questions before I go any further? Richard, are you there? I am, Harry. How are you? Okay, I'm not seeing the questions, so if there's any questions you want to, uh, for some reason I'm not seeing them, sorry about that. Um, they're, they're in the question section, and people have, have held off with their questions until uh, okay, later, good. although I see. What are your technical tools? There's one question that just came in. What are your technical tools? Well, I was referring to the, um, well, for example, in, on TC2000, and this is very important, I set up, and it's so easy to do, you just go into easy scan, set up your own scan, put any criteria you want it, and it isn't programming. I just put down leading percent gainers, NYSE, Amex, and NASDAQ. And this is the list that pops up during the course of the day. You see that the leading percent gainers today, let me quickly sort that. And in the beginning of the day, 
I'm looking for a couple of things. I'm looking for price movement, and I'm looking for volume buzz, as well as the percent gain. I want to see all of that. Then I look at the chart, and I want to see how that affects us. Now, this morning, I did give us a buy on the first pullback on this stock down in this range here, around the 49 area, with a target of 52.5. It didn't get there. It did bounce a little bit, and then it went sideways for four hours. Late in the day, it popped. What this tells me is that this is possibly a trade for tomorrow. Watch for this for a strong opening, and maybe I'll run up into that range tomorrow. That was a what I would call an unsuccessful day trade. On the other hand, this was a successful one because it popped, gave you a little pullback, and then spiked up right there. And it formed a flag and stair-stepped its way up for the next three hours. That was a nice channel up intraday. And, of course, once that channel broke here, either you were stopped out or you sold it when it reached your target at 29. It got up to 29 exactly. Well, let's go over some of the day trades that we talked about today. This is, this is just a percent gain of this, but well, I have a thing called the Tech Trader Universe, where in the morning I'm looking at stocks that are gapping up pre-market. One of the sources I use is briefing.com. It's a great news service. It's only like 19 bucks a month. It gives you so much darn information you wouldn't believe it. And in the morning pre-market, it tells you what stocks are gapping up and the news on those stocks. And um, you can often do extremely well by just keeping track of those gappers and taking a look at the date, the chart, or whether it means it's gapping up or breaking out. Now, in the morning, I'm usually looking at 15-minute charts so I can gain the, so I can look at the uh, pattern over a period of time. Um, and I want to see if this gap up, which in this case was here, started to move and immediately took out resistance there, or gapped up to it and kept it started to run. One of the reasons why I wanted to wait for the first pullback to see what developed. On the one-minute chart, you can see that it developed a nice little little wedge pattern here that broke out and formed a flag. There was a couple of chances to buy that stock today. Here's an interesting one, one of, which is one I did not recommend. Why? Because the total volume for the day was only 412,000. Now, that was 440% more than normal. But at the time in the morning, it was kind of um, choppy and a little sloppy. It did form a little rising or ascending wedge, and then it had a beautiful percent move from here about four and a half, it went up to 540. 90 cents on a, this is a 20% move from here to there in three hours. Unfortunately, I told, we talked about it and followed it, but I didn't put a buy alert on it, only because it was too thin. I told, I do tell my people about stocks that I don't put buy alerts on, because we follow them during the course of the day. Now, about every 45 minutes to an hour, I'll come on, I'll do a live video update and show the progression of the charts intraday, and I may tell, People at some point, if this pattern is broken with any kind of volume surge, like in here, for example, it may be a buy. And sure enough, from this level up here, about 465, it was a nice scalp trade. Another one, uh, Nautilus was one also that was similar to uh, one of the stocks I just showed you, ININ. Notice that they both did the same thing. They gapped up, they coiled, and then they just went sideways for the rest of the day. Same thing happened with Nautilus. NLS. It popped, it pulled back, it popped, it formed a little wedge here. And I was looking for this stock to make a more substantial move, but I also told my people to wait. Why do we wait for this to develop? This is a perfect example why you wait for the pattern to break out. Because this one moved down, it didn't break support, but that little move down caused it to go sideways for quite a few hours until at the end of the day, it did finally pop. Notice the surge in unbalanced volume. For those of you who don't know what unbalanced volume is, it's the amount of upticks uh, minus the downticks in terms of volume upticks and volume downticks. And at the end of the day, they plot that on a line. Notice that buying at the end of the day here, huge. I would watch this stock tomorrow in LS for a, a follow-through session, which could get it up to eight and a half, three quarters. CLIR was a stock we also followed. It ran up, it pulled back, it formed a little nice wedge, it broke out, it formed a beautiful little pennant, it kept stair-stepping its stock way higher. And it got and it went from this level here where it broke out about nine and a quarter to ten thirty-nine. Beautiful percentage move there. And I don't if for example, here's a here's a perfect example of um, of a stock that even though I liked the way it looked, I, I, I didn't like the volume on it. 
the bond came in towards the afternoon, but in the morning it was moving up nicely. I chose chose not to buy it. You know, you have to be discerning about what stocks to trade. Here's another one. No more popped and formed a coil, but the whole day it traded 321,000. Now, if you bought it and just kept raising your stop, you'd be fine. But I'm looking for stocks to trade a little bit more volume. In the case of MHR, 5.6 million, up 11%. Look what it did early on. Popped, pulled back, popped again, didn't get through the high, pulled back and got very narrow, very quiet, and then here's where it popped, and it started to move. And then pulled back and flagged, popped and flagged, and exploded into the close. A very nice move from about 305 up to 330 for a little scalp. IDT is another. This stock is very thinly traded, so I don't uh, want to trade a stock that for the whole day traded 273,000. But even that, take a look at what the relative volume was. We have to consider relative volume. This is the biggest volume day of 273,000 that this stock has had since way back in December of 2011. Look at the beautiful base that it formed. You have to consider where a stock is in point in time. It broke out, it pulled back and consolidated, it ran up to resistance again, again, on the wedge, broke out, we tested, and here it's running again. So this is an old favorite of mine, but I'm choosing not to trade it just because it's too thin. On the other hand, HIMX is a superstar for us this year. We picked it here when it broke out, we picked it here when it broke out, and again here. We've made three trades on the stock in the last three months, and it's been beautiful. This is the company rumored to be a supplier for Google Glass, and as a result, you can see the beautiful trend there. Very similar chart is RVLT. We picked it here, here, and here. Each time after a long consolidation, got very quiet and narrow, the volume exploded. Here's a wedge. It broke out, popped, coiled, popped, and it's consolidating again right now. See it? This may very well reach a $6 level before not too long. My first target's four and a half. My second target's about five and a quarter, and then six. But those are some examples of day trades. First solar was another beauty for us. It exploded and pulled back. We gave you a buy on the pullback. Why? Because I felt like the, that was a game changer. It had a major announcement. The stock literally went from 26 to 41 in one day. But the consolidation was so bullish. It came on lower volume with increasing technicals. I decided to put a swing trade out at 37 with a target of 44. And went right up to that level. It kept going. It actually reached 47 yesterday. 47.78, the first the earnings came out and the stock dropped back to that. Selling news, right? Here's the bottom line what I'm looking for intraday. I'd love to see a rising channel because that's the kind of stock when you're in a rising channel intraday. Like in the case of ACAD. I'm sorry. ARNA. There you go. If your stock's in a rising channel, you can ride it all day until that channel breaks. Here's your rising bottoms line. I told most of my people we had a target of 840.45, 848, something like that. It reached right up to 843, backed off, and I finally did reach my target at 851 before a big reversal bar knocked it back down. It's firm in the after hours today, but we'll have to just see what happens tomorrow. I just tell my people that one of the other things that people have a problem with is where to sell it. I always tell people, I'll give you an initial and then a secondary target. If a stock reaches its initial target, you can always help or you should sell half your position and then either raise your stops and keep a trailing stop or just look where support is. In the case of um, ARNA, once it reached my target here, the stop would have been right about there. It never violated that stop. It didn't violate the trend line. They kept going higher level. Now, it didn't reach my secondary target, which was 865. But it came down. It may very well get there tomorrow. But what I look for is channel ups. When you see channel ups during the day, a stock that channels like that, we've had so many great examples of that during the course of um, last week, even in this week. Um, and then once in a while, we'll see a stock like this, PKT, which gaps up and then pulls back and does nothing for several hours. But it did consolidate in its little mini base. Then it ran up to that base and formed a little flag. I noted that to my subscribers. I told them if it should break out of here, let's go for a late afternoon scalp trade. We did it. 14.15. My target was 14.50, 55. We went up to 14.59 and backed off, but it closed well too. 
So that's an example of some of the trades we like to put out on day trades and why. Sometimes they come late. A lot of times they come early. This one did not. Um, for example, if I said buy the first pullback and pull back to support and broke it immediately, retested it and failed, I'd have been out here. I would have been back in there. The problem with um, very, very many people that I know, once they sell a stock that they lost money on, even if it's a nickel, they won't go back into it. I'm always looking for redemption. <laughs> so let's go over some more of the day trades that we did today. Here's an example of a stock that is a swing trade of mine. I'll show you first of all why it's a swing trade. AOL was a swing trade. I told all my people when it gapped up here and consolidated for a few months, it was probably going to move again. It broke out here. It broke out there. We had a target of 40. It reached 37.90 and backed off. But look at how, for how many weeks this stock held support, broke out, retested. And when I saw this developing here, I put a swing trade as soon as it broke out. And so far, it's working. I have a target of um, 44.45 on this one. IQNT is another swing trade of ours. It exploded on big volume and wedged for two days. And when it broke out here, I put a swing on it yesterday. I think the stock carries forward. If you want to see more volume, but the technicals are excellent. The stock has moved out above resistance, and it's in the gap. A lot of times when a stock moves into the gap, it at least fills half of it, if not all of it. So what I would do here is tell everybody, take a look at the gap, cut it in half, go back to your five-minute chart, and there's my first target, about 6, 10, 15. Second target, 7. I'll also look at trends and channels. Channel tops are important. Here's a stock that's forming a rising channel. At the very least, it's a rising wedge. The first target for a scalp trade would have to be near 5 and 3 quarters, 5.80. That's a scalp trade. If it blows through that, you're looking at 6 and a quarter, roughly, or 6.15. And that's just how I set up targets in today. A few more examples. Dish Network was a perfect example today. Excuse me, <laughs> DirecTV, their competitor. They pop. Falling wedges are very interesting. People think that falling wedges are negative. I say they're bullish. Rising wedges, are, uh, they think, are bullish. I say they're bearish. What it shows is a loss of downside selling momentum when the pattern narrows. And when it gets to the rising 50 on a one-minute chart, we often see this. For the rest of the day, that stock was firm all session. And when it broke out here, around 60, I said, look for two or three points. It got up to 62.07, so we got exactly two points on it. That acted well today. Look at URBN today. Perfect example of what I'm talking about in terms of day trade channels. It gaps up. It creates a little falling wedge. Halts the decline at the 21 period moving average. I use, by the way, 10, 21, and 50 period moving averages. When it... Pops out of there and then form a quiet, look how narrow and quiet it got in here, very quiet at the apex. That's what I call the low volume ebb, EBB, like the ebb and tide. If you get a low volume ebb, it gets very quiet and then starts to pop as volume increases, that's my buy. We put a buy out at 42 and a half, went to 43.80. Nice little day trade scalp. We talked about read. A good example. Arena was terrific today for our subscribers. SGY. Here's another example of the pop, the pullback, and the channel up all day. When a stock channels, you have nothing to do except keep raising your stop all day. Where's the stop put in? When I see a stock do this and then it breaks out, what I immediately do is I put a stop across highs and lows. That would be my stopping point if that line breaks. Or across these tops right in here. Notice it didn't break anywhere all day. There's another stopping point. The stock acted beautifully all afternoon and kept channeling up. That's what you want to see when you're looking at an intraday day trade. The best part about day trading, folks, what is it? At, the, at night, you're in cash and you can sleep well. You don't have to worry about the market gapping up or gapping down on you.
And a couple more examples. We showed you CLIR earlier as a beautiful channel lock. Nice example of a channel lock. Interesting stock here. Um, THRM, it popped up, and then it formed a tight coil. Look how narrow and quiet it got. Now, it didn't look like a big trade when it broke out here a little bit. But then it kept going slowly but surely, and it moved from uh, 1635 to 17. That's a nice little scalp trade. Now, here's one that didn't really work well. It exploded and pulled back. If you bought it right here in a pullback, you made a few cents, but we were looking for much more. I was looking for a breakout of that line and a move up into that level. Never got it. However, I tell all my people, the trades that don't work, as long as they don't break down, I usually set up for the next day. So I'll keep DWRE on my list for tomorrow and watch and see if it busts over 30, 40, 30, 50. And look for a scalp up to 31 and a quarter. Now here's a trade that didn't work. And that's why I wanted to show you a couple of where we stop a stock that doesn't work. An explosive move with one, two gaps here in the first couple of minutes. Very explosive. This stock literally went from the opening price at 24.31 to 25.88, a dollar fifty in four minutes. Then it pulled down and bounced around. I immediately drew a line there and drew a line here and said, "Okay, it could be a wedge, but it's not an ascending wedge. An ascending wedge has a flat top and rising bottoms. In this case, a descending wedge." which is vulnerable to a breakdown, has flat bottoms and declining tops. And it usually indicates that that, that that stock could be channeling down the rest of the day if it doesn't break back out. Instead, see this one bar here? That broke it down, that stopped us out. But it saved you four or five hours of pain. Another example of one of our swing trades on a daily chart is Cree. Number one in LED lighting in the world, when I saw the major declining tops line, it's got a two-day chart. Big down channel. Broke out, pulled back from the wedge. Notice this big wedging type of base pattern. It broke breakaway gap here, ran up to resistance, broke through but couldn't follow through, backed off. But it held the moving average. That was the big breakaway gap that mattered. And why did it matter? Look at the size of the volume. The biggest volume day since August of the year before that a year and a half. When you get a breakout of a major base pattern on that kind of buying, it often leads to more upside. So Cree did very well for us, and now it's moving up higher. I have a target now in the uh, mid-60s, but I think you can get to mid-70s um, if provided the market holds together. Look at the unbalanced buying. It shows steady accumulation. Institutions are not, repeat, not selling the stock. A couple more of my potential swing trades. When this gapped up through this here and then formed this little wedge, I put a buy on it when it broke out. It moved a little bit, about a point, point and a half, but couldn't get to the prior high and backed off. Now it's getting very quiet. Is it going to break up or down? Well, it is a descending wedge, so the odds are it could make a break. So I instructed all my people where support is and where the stops would be. If this is taken out, I would look for a move to test that level. And hopefully that doesn't break, but because, because below that, I want to sell the stock. IMMR, this was a beauty for us as it broke through the base here with a big breakaway gap. I put a swing trade on it that day, at seven and three quarters, with a target at 11, uh, 10 and three quarters and 12, excuse me. Hit 10 and three quarters here, and then 12 a couple days later, backed and filled a beautiful kind of consolidation large flag. Fine, got very quiet near the end of it here, then exploded, and we put another swing trade on it two days ago with a target at 15, 15 and a half. It got up to 14 today and backed off. Mankind's another. When a stock breaks like this with big volume through a key resistance and breaks out of a base pattern, I'm interested. It ran up to this high, a little bit above it, and then backed off and formed a beautiful bull wedge. A bull wedge is something that narrows and narrows and narrows. Look how quiet it was for a week here as the volume got a little bit lower. And then it popped, formed another wedge, popped again. This time, however, this pop went to the top of the channel, parallel channel to the bottom. It then formed another multi-week wedge. Three days ago, I gave a recommendation when it popped out, but it didn't follow through. 
Sometimes they do that. They'll pop out and they'll pull back. But it's an indication. My, I find that high volume zone pop. See the whole volume here? 4.5 million. That was the biggest volume it traded in three weeks. It looked like to me it was going to break out. Instead, it backed off. We tested it, and now it's firming up again. Well, this is one to watch. I also believe that stocks move in five waves, folks, five waves, intraday and on a daily chart. For me, this is the key breakout above here when volume first came in is where I start to count. This is where the breakout occurred, in my opinion. We had a one, two, three, four-wave move. I'm looking for a fifth wave. It gets it up to five and a quarter, five and a half. That's my swing trade target for that. PKT, well, um, very interesting stock. You can see, and by the way, um, last year or the year before last, we had a wonderful trade on this one. When it broke out here and pulled back, and the stock really did well for us up for over the next few weeks. It did eventually come down. Look at, so I'm familiar with this company and the stock. Great earnings report. The stock popped. exploded right to the channel, the down channel top, backed off the test support, and then today bounced 43 cents. Uh, volume wasn't heavy. It's not a heavily traded stock. But if this takes out this line, I'm looking for here, here, and there. And I have a swing trade on this one. It may need some more consolidation. We'll see. Three days may not be enough. But that's a huge breakaway gap. It took out the 10, 21, and 50-day moving averages in one fell swoop one day. Not going to get through there. We shall see. The stock I like, I've had a swing trade on a couple times this year, is MyTech. It's the company that uh, does the mobile imaging um, software for your um, uh, iPhone or cell phone where you can take a picture of your check and it's deposited, or you can take a picture of your bill and they pay your bill for you. It's a pretty cool company. Um, this big drop here was as, as a result of a lawsuit. But the stock came back, we tested, and look at the stair step channel that's in now. MyTech finally broke a key key resistance level last week. We put a swing on it. It's consolidating. The earnings came out tonight. Um, you know, it's, it's a low price stock that doesn't have a lot of earnings. They actually lost two cents for the quarter. But revenues were up 170% for the quarter over last year. And you can see that it uh, traded well. It closed 544 and traded up to 568 in the aftermarket. We'll see what happens. My target on MyTech is. Six and three quarters and seven and a quarter coming up, coming up, I believe. We'll see if it reaches up there. Now, let's take a look at Yahoo because I find this extremely interesting. Here's a stock that went nowhere for a year. I mean, literally traded in a range from 14 and a half to 16. What's the key day for this stock? Right here, a breakaway gap that took out that line with the biggest buying of the year. That day, Yahoo traded 71 million shares. That's the biggest volume it traded in two years uh, when it was running up here. So what did that do? It triggered a beautiful rising channel. And look how this stock, channel top, channel bottom, channel bottom, channel top, back to the bottom. Basically, it's in a beautiful a parallel rising channel. And what did it do today? It spiked up to 26.79 from where we first saw the breakout at 16, a 10-point mover about um, about 45 percent, something like that, just in the last seven months. Not bad for Yahoo, which was laying there doing nothing for many years. The problem is we, we need to determine what we're trading and what, what time frame we're trading on. And we have a lot of different type of trades during the course of the session. I also have a swing trade service where I will put out trades that have done very well. If you look on my website, you'll see uh, some of the last picks that you know, we're up between 15 and, and 50 or, 80, or 60 percent in just a few days to a couple weeks. So that's what we look for. To me, it's different between a day trade, a swing trade, uh, and a, an intermediate trade. A swing trade is anywhere from three to five days to as much as three or four weeks. That's a swing trade. I really don't think a swing trade, once you're past a month, is it becomes more of an intermediate trade to me. So, so just to reiterate one more time, what I'm looking for is the stocks that are going to gap up on a strong news and then trend the rest of the day. Urban Outfitters was a great example today as they ran from 41 up to 42 and a half quickly, consolidated for an hour and a half, and then ran the rest of the day. SGY, another example. 
as, a, as was Arena. And those are the kind of stocks you want to be in for day trades. I think, um, Rich, uh, at this point, I'd like to take some questions and give people a lot of time because there's a lot of people in the room. So well, why don't we do that? Um, Sounds great, Harry. You have the list in front of you. Can, you can just scroll down and see which questions you'd like to answer. Well, unfortunately, I'm not able to open this up. It's not opening for me. You can still, you can still uh, see the question um, uh, bar. It's, it's a blue bar that says questions on it, Harry. And, uh, well, I know that, but it's not, it's not expanding for me. I, I can only see one line at a time, unfortunately. So let, let, let me do this. Um, okay. One question is, uh, how would I trail a stop and what things may cause the stop to change? Is that correct? To exit a trade before your profit target is reached. Anytime, okay, this is a perfect example. Um, number one, I set stops below important lows. In other words, when a stock pulls back and bounces, my, and, and I'm determining what to do with it, once it breaks out, my stop is one of two places, at the apex of the breakout point or at the prior low. I, wanna, I don't want a stock to start making lower lows. I want them to make higher lows. Now, in this case here, this is where I stopped this stock if I hadn't sold it in my target. I instruct everybody, if you haven't sold this and you're waiting for eight. 6065, which is my secondary target, you need to stop it under about 830. 82830 was my stop. Now you got stopped out, didn't really go down much, but in a lot of cases they go down substantially. In the case of HIMX, I want to show you this. We traded this beautifully this morning. I said buy the first pullback, it pulled right back to support, it exploded, it gave me a little flag, and exploded again. Basically a one, two, three, four, five wave move. I told all you I told you before that anytime you get a one, two, three, four, five wave move, the fifth wave is a steady strong move up. Be careful of a rollover or at least a consolidation of some coin. And I also instructed my traders at that time to keep this line in mind. So most of them were stopped under 665 right here. Subsequently, three hours later, it was trading at 605. Now when it broke the declining top sign and then took this level out. First of all, I gave everybody a heads up that it was basing intraday that formed a little flag. And if I got a volume breakout here, let's do an afternoon scalp. And it went from 625 to 660 by the close, and that didn't take more than an hour, so that was a good scalp. But where I set stops is, in my mind, it depends on channels. I don't want the channel to break. It depends on prior lows. If a prior low and a prior higher at the same point in time, that's, to me, a pretty important point. The first sign of weakness in the stock was not the rollover, but the break of support. Even though it bounced back, it did it on a lower volume. And to me, at the time, I noted, I've said to everybody, be careful that this isn't a rising bear wedge. And that's exactly what it turned out to be. The stock rolled over, bounced, and rolled over some more before finally recovering at the end of the day. So that would cause me to exit as soon as I see a break. But in this case, my target was 7 we got up to 699 within a penny. Look, if I give you a target of seven, you guys should always say, I'll take a couple cents less. Because if I'm a penny or two off, I don't want you to have to give all your profits back for a couple cents. You probably should have sold half of it here and half of it there. Let's take some more questions. At what point do you stop to break even as well? Well, um, I don't stop to break even. I stop to when a stock breaks at a certain point. If that's a loss, fine. If it's a, a gain, fine. But I'm not, anybody who's in a stock to be even, it should not be in the market. You're not trading to be even. You're trading to make money. And if a stock breaks down, I mean, I don't, I don't know what the point is of breaking even on a stock if it doesn't break support. Can I show you a wedge? Coil, you can't tell the difference. Well, uh, like I said, a wedge is more symmetrical and a coil is more narrow. Let's see if we can find some examples. This is a falling wedge, but it's not a good example. Let me find a... This is a coil because it's elongated. Elongated means it's stretched out and it gets narrower and narrower. A wedge is symmetrical and it comes to the apex and then breaks down. I'll have to find some examples for you. I don't see any here right here. Well, this is kind of a wedge. See it here? Where the, a little bit more symmetrical. At the time here, it was a wedge pattern. 
and yet I could have called this here more of a coil. The coil is thinner and narrower, our wedges are wider. It's, it's, you know, it's just a question of math. Or <laughs> this is a coil for sure. Now if the pattern looked like this and like that, it would be a wedge. Hope I've answered your question. At least that's the way I look at it. How long will I hold the trade? That's a good question. Well, bottom line is, I hold the trade for as long as I need to, meaning that I let the trade run, or it, and two things will occur. Either it hits my target or it hits my stop. Or it's the end of the day, the stock is running into the close, I make my decision to sell it. I do not hold stocks overnight in the day trade room. If they're a swing trade, you can hold them overnight. If they're a day trade, don't come to me at the last five minutes to say, should I hold this overnight? The answer is, in 100% of the cases, don't hold it overnight. Now, if you want to hold it overnight because it had a strong close and you think it may open the next day, that's on you. But that's not my recommendation. Now, this is a good one. This is in between a coil and a wedge. It's closer to a coil than a wedge because it's elongated. That's a coil. This is more uh, closer to a wedge than anything else, but it's still a coil to me. So I'm not seeing a lot of wedges today. Isn't that interesting? This is more of a coil. This is more of a wedge right here. See it? But you can call it a coil. Does it, what, does it really matter what you call it? The bottom line is it's a consolidation pattern and it's narrowing near the apex. Coils and wedges and pennants. A pennant is a real. A pennant is a smaller coil, a very small period of time coil. This is, wouldn't be called a coil, it would be called a pennant. A pennant, it comes off of an up, up flag. A difference between a pennant and a flag, a flag looks like this, more parallel, usually. It would be more of a flag versus narrowing tops and rising bottoms. That's a coil. Do I recommend taking promise? along the way to my target. Yeah, I do. Um, I think that if you have, and by the way, the problem is if you're trading two, 300 shares, it's pretty difficult to do. But if you're trading a $10 stock and you have um, 5,000 shares, why not trade 1,000 out every 30, 40 cents up? You can do that, or you can wait till it gets to target one, sell half, target two, sell half. Or after, here's what I do. When I sell my first half, I immediately set a stop so that I'm going to protect my profit in the second half, too. But it's not going to be right there. It's going to be set below a certain um, support level. In the case of this one, for example, when it broke out here, I would have stopped it right in that zone here. Look how it went right to it and bounced. Same thing here. The stock break, breaks out of this little coil and pulls right back to it this afternoon, but it did not break it, and it ran right back up again. This is how you stay in a trade. How do I keep track of some of these that can solve it for so long? Well, I'll tell you what I do, folks. This is something you've got to do. If you're invested in the market and you're day trading, you need to do what I do. And this is what I do all session. I have a list here. There's only about 15, 20 stocks on it, maybe 25. I'm doing this all day. I'm scrolling through charts to see what may be developing. And you'll be seeing me do this because I have a live webinar on all day. So you watch me as I'm going through my list. And you'll see what I do. I may go like this. I may draw the line, pull it back, change the angle of ascent. I may form coils and wedges. But you'll see me doing it so you'll know what I'm up to. I may do this. I may eliminate that one little bar because the rest of the lines line up there. That, to me, was a late consolidation and a bullish one, except at the end of the day, there was some decent selling on it. But all day, I'm looking at patterns. I'm going through these kinds of patterns here, so you'll see what, what, what's going on. So that's that. That's the bottom line. That's what I do here. So uh, you're going to have to see uh, me scroll to understand what I'm doing. But I'm scrolling when I'm not on. And then every hour, 45 minutes, I'm on live, and I actually describe what I'm seeing and what I'm looking at. In the case of MHR, I may say, if this breaks out of this apex, and look how quiet and narrow it is, 
with any kind of volume increase, we're going to buy, do a, a scalp trade on it. And that worked out. Or in the case of Arena, same thing here. When it broke out of the coil, we were aggressive with it and bought it. We made some good money on that one today. And again, in the case of IDT, if you even though it's a thinner stock, if you went in here, we had a really nice quick scalp trade. PKT worked out very well for us at the end of the day when it broke out here. But all day I was watching this develop, did nothing until I saw that move out. The only way you can do that, you can put alerts on. But if I put alerts on, they're going to be buzzing all day and disturbing everybody. So what I do is I scroll all day, do the top 15 or 20 charts, look for patterns, and I may flag them or I may take them off the list or I may move the lines around or I may create patterns or change patterns. The one thing people don't do is they don't put the trend lines in. And they don't change the trend lines. They leave them there. In the case of this, in the beginning, the trend line looked a little different. It was more like this. And then at the end of the day, it looked more like that. You got it? And then I may, I may have in the morning had a channel that looked like that, expecting it to go up to there. It was my target. It didn't work. So I pull it back down, connect the highs and lows, and you have what it looks like in the sending coil. Uh, with with um, the case of my tech, I was looking for this stock to break out. It didn't, but it snapped back nicely, and then after hours it traded up to 568. But, so that, that's what we look for during the course of the day. Now I'm going to add, add to answer another couple of questions here. Um, how do I select the stocks to check patterns? Like I said, I'm looking in the morning, pre-market, for stocks that are gapping up, by stocks that are moving percentage-wise, and you can see them trading pre-market. Um, and I'm looking for patterns, not only on the one and five minute, these are five minute charts. I'm looking for patterns first on a daily chart, if it's breaking through a key level. Uh, then I'm looking for a 15 minute chart to get an idea of the last couple weeks to see what the overall structure looks like. I may draw a line like this and like that, keep the little wedge going on it. Here's a, this is more of a wedge, see it? That is not a coil. I consider that a wedge because it's wider. But then I go to the one minute chart to see now how does that look on a one minute chart. Here's your declining tops line. Let me adjust that. And um, if we can get it up through here, then the stock has a chance of making another move. So there's various different factors that go into it. How do I differentiate from a swing or a day trade? Well, on a, on a swing trade, I'm really looking for a move over several days. So what I'm going to do is look at a 15-minute chart to get an idea of the pattern over a course of a few sessions. I may want to see what the last few days look like. And if, for example, this was breaking out down in here, very quiet and narrow, all of a sudden it thrusts on volume and breaks through a resistance level, I may be putting a swing trade on here, which would have worked out nicely. But uh, that's a 15-minute chart. Then I drill down to the one minute and see what the patterns look like as it's emerging. I mean, I have, there's been plenty of cases where I put a day trade and a swing trade on within minutes of each other because I think it's going to be a good day trade. But it's all, And the reason I think it's going to be a good day trade is because it's breaking through a key resistance level, and that key resistance level may trigger a move like this. So then that's how I determine what a swing trade is. It's really on, on a different time frame. Time frame. Now, also, we're always looking at the, at the daily chart, always, to see, for example, look at Reed. Notice it broke the, in one day, it broke all the moving averages, the major declining top line, and broke through lateral resistance, and went right up to my target at 540. Look at the height today. 539. How about that? That was my target this morning. And uh, for a day trade. Now, a swing trade, if this moves tomorrow, we can very well see the stock trade at six and a quarter and maybe as high as seven and a quarter. This looks like a major breakout. Look at the volume. It isn't very heavy, but relatively it is. Harry? Yeah. Harry? Yes. Harry, yeah, I just want to mention that we're five minutes left in this session, and I just wanted to give everybody um, and yourself a heads up to that. As well, I wanted to mention, remind everyone that if you're interested in ha having Harry's analysis intraday, visit www.thetechtrader.com. Harry, do you just mind showing the home page for a moment? The first 25 people who sign up for 
the free trial today will receive a free educational DVD set by Harry. Just note the word webinar in the Heard of Us From field in the sign up form. By the yeah, way, guys, www.thetechtrader.com. There's a list on the left here of some of our recent day, uh, swing trades. These are swing trades. And look at the percent gains in what period of time. And we even have a short minute that worked pretty well, too, 18% in two weeks. So, um, and there's some testimonials there that'll tell you what some of the people are thinking about and not what they think about me. And then we have a few, once you're a member, you click on here and you get a member room. I'm going to quickly show them that, Rachel. That's cool. Basically, is a, um, a training room with comments from in, uh, individuals as well as myself. We go back a little bit. We we'll see comments from other people in the room here. Uh, questions, answers, and then after the market closes, I put out uh, art articles um, of consequence that we may have some interest in. But you can comment on it. You can reply to it. It's pretty cool. Um, so I want to answer just a few more questions before we go. I know there's hundreds of them, so. How do I come to use a 10, 21, and 50? Well, for many years, I used a 10, 21, and 40. I found that the 40-day moving average is right on the button. In so many cases, it's scary on daily charts. But I find that every once in a while, it's so tight this is, that you want to give yourself some leeway. So I put in a 50 because the other thing I found about in talking to my institutional clients, all of their traders are following 50-day moving averages. Even the books you read about the major movers in history, the institutional traders were looking for the pullback to the 50 when they bought it. Um, so we look for stocks that are pulling back towards the 50 and bouncing. And that's a, an indication of a healthy trend. HIMX, for example, pulled right back just above the 50, held support, and bounced nicely. So, um, But in the course of my 45 years of trading, the 10-day is something I find that it Close, the 10 day is pretty good for short term trading. The 50 day is more for uh, intermediate or swing trading. And the 10 day is a good, good indicator. A lot of times when they hold it during the course of the day, it's a good indication that the stock is going to go higher. In some cases, they're, they're meaningless. But for the most part, it took me years and years of developing um, and getting comfortable with certain indicators. And that's the three I use. How come you make it look so easy? Because I've been doing it for 45 years, that's why. And, and look, I didn't give you shorts, but I do have a list of boxer shorts. And let me give you some examples. NTI is one I put out recently. Um, it broke down from the wedge. It came down. I still think it's going lower. We'll see. Terrible technicals. Look at this. RNF worked out great for us. When the stock broke down here and formed this little wedge, and broke down and formed another wedge. I finally put it out here at 41 with a target of 30. It went all the way down to 29.90. How about that? And popped. So, yeah, I got a whole list here of boxer shorts. Today, one of our boxer shorts got crushed vitamin shops for $4.08 or 8%. You can see how it broke this. Now, this is a wedge right here. See this wedge? Broke the wedge with a breakaway gap to the downside. Not pretty. Volcano has been on my list for months when it broke down and formed this rising wedge and then broke down again and formed another rising wedge. One, two, three, four, five waves down. It's still on my list, but I told I tell everybody after five waves down and your target achieved, it's time to consider covering your shorts. AWW, little head and shoulders, broke down from the large rising channel. And when that broke, we put a short out on it, and look what happened to it. Reached my target right there. It's plenty, and Cyberonics is another. Look at this one, folks. Left shoulder, head, and right shoulder. Massive top. It hasn't broken the neckline yet, but it's right on it. If this breaks, it can just fall apart. CYBS. Keep your eyes on that. 